join us for the newly dubbed Phi Alpha Delta speaker series. Um, we have a great panel today. Um, Christy or Kristen Nichols is going to try and join us in a little bit. They had some technical difficulties, but today we have Glenn Milgram and Mary Fenske, and they'll both be talking about their mediation and alternative dispute resolution practice. Um, so with that said, I'm going to go ahead and get started, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves. Um, I'm Michelle Isherwood. I'm a member of Phi Alpha Delta Humphrey Chapter and San Francisco Alumni Chapter. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. If you have questions, go ahead and type them in the box. We'll start out with some prepared questions and then we'll move to any questions. We'll open the floor up to questions from everyone on the chat. So again, thank you all for joining us and I'll go ahead and get started with um, Mary and Glenn. Mary, do you want to introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about your, your practice? Sure. So um, I'm Mary Fenske. I am currently the district justice for District 10. I, I'm out in Minnesota. Um, I've been a member of Phi Alpha Delta since my third year of law school. I started off in Kellogg chapter and I'm now a member of the Twin Cities alumni chapter. Um, I've been an attorney for a little over 10 years and mostly focused in family law. And in Minnesota, that means you are absolutely part of alternative dispute resolution because if you file a divorce um, in most of our counties, you're immediately funneled through an, an ADR process, which we'll talk a little bit about later on tonight as well. And so I'm really happy to be here. Great, thank you, Mary. How, Glenn, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and your practice? Sure, I'm Glenn Milgram. I came to Phi Alpha Delta in 1983 as a charter member of Toro uh, chapter at Toro Law School. Uh, after that, it, I charted the Brooklyn Queens alumni chapter. I am currently the District uh, 21 District Justice. I'm a past International Associate Tribune. Uh, I've been practicing law now for over 30 years, uh, mainly matrimonial, real estate, and now I've integrated into mediation as I'm trying to phase a little out of the litigation and go more towards mediation in order as I head towards retirement. Uh, but that transition is taking a long while, of course. I'm admitted in both New York and New Jersey. I am both a mediator on the court's roster for civil as well as matrimonial. And I'm also qualified to do domestic violence in the appropriate situations. Great, thank you. Um, let's get started with the questions. What skills does someone need to be set successful at mediation and ADR? Do you wanna well, start, or Grun, go ahead. To be successful is a little tough to answer. The reality is it's based upon your experience. Uh, any experience you could bring as an expert in your particular field will help you to mediate cases in those fields. Uh, generally speaking, it's knowing how to listen. It's knowing how to get people to cooperate with each other. It's understanding what the facts are and understanding that mediation is probably the first time the parties are seeing each other across the table, uh, if it's a litigated matter. Uh, you also have to realize that a very successful litigator, uh, mediator is going to be somebody who can be creative because in mediation, you don't necessarily have to follow the law. You just have to make sure what they do is legal. So in other words, they could be as creative as they want in order to work out a resolution. Great, Mary, what do you think? So I agree about the listening and it depends on what side of the mediation table you're sitting on. So I am a mediator in Minnesota, um, but I only mediate family law cases. So I'm not on the roster for any other case. Um, I'm also a parenting consultant, which is best described as a, as a private judge for hire. So divorcing or divorced or separated families can choose to hire me we go through mediation on a topic right now, honestly, it's the COVID vaccine, right? For kids that are 12 to 18 years old. 
one parent wants a child vaccinated, the other parent doesn't. So it's my job to lead a mediation, except at the point that either party says, I can't go any further, the, the decision is then mine. So in a mediation, I would just have to stop and say, well, we didn't resolve and now you and your attorneys are gonna go off and file a motion and the judge will decide. But when I'm the parenting consultant, I then stop kind of the, the ADR process and I say, okay, now I'm gonna make the decision for you. I usually give them a certain amount of time to give me any additional information they think is important. And then I have to go investigate the matter. Um, it takes anywhere from a few days to a few weeks, depending on what issue they brought to me. And then I issue a decision. That decision becomes their court order within 14 days and they can appeal my decision, but they appeal it to district court first. So in those situations, I am although neutral in the beginning, right? Just helping them lead that conversation like a mediation. They know that at some point I'm not neutral anymore and I'm gonna issue a decision and one person's gonna like me and the other person isn't just because that's usually the way family disputes go. Um, and then they have to keep coming back to me because I am hired from anywhere between two years or up until your child is 18 years old, depending on what the contract is. So listening is really important. And also, um, you know, oddly, explaining if you don't give somebody the same amount of time and remembering like if you're the mediator, that party is, especially on Zoom, is gonna look on the corner of their screen and be like, well, she left at 10.15 and she came back at 11.08. So I got this many minutes with her. You know, so just balancing that out, I think is really important as well. Are there any courses or organizations that you would recommend for someone who's interested in doing mediation or alternative dispute resolution? And then to add on that, are there, do you need to be certified to practice in this field? Um, is that, do you know if that's state specific or, or, you know, what sorts of certifications, even if you don't have to be certified, what sort of a certification would then be helpful? I think that is state by state. Um, in Minnesota to be placed on the mediation roster, I attended a class, I have to pay dues. I also have to do um, continuing education credits that I report. And those education credits, unlike my attorney credits, the ADR credits have to be specific to ADR and I have to defend why they count towards those, um, towards those hours. So it's not just, Yep, I went to some CLE last night. It's no, the CLE was about culture and mediation or gender and negotiations. And I have to explain why, why it counted. Um, as for classes, if as a law student, I wish I had gotten my certification before I left law school. Like I, had, um, in, I went to school in Minnesota too, we had multiple law schools at the time I was going to school. And I wish I had taken that opportunity because it took a week long class to get um, qualified as a mediator. And it was well over a thousand dollars. I became a parenting consultant. It was a week long class, again, well over a thousand dollars. And I also became an early neutral evaluator, which is a mediator who actually evaluates your case, either a social aspect or financial. And again, it was a week long class with thousands of dollars. <laughs> so I mean, you can see the trend here, right? Yeah. So like, I don't get paid if I don't work. So every time I have to take that week off, it's, it's unpaid. Um, you know, yes, I can make those hours up at night, but I also have three small children, a husband, I'm a coach, a Girl Scout leader. I mean, there's, there's already pulls on my time. Um, and so I wish I had taken the classes that would have offered those certifications in law school when I, I had the time and it would have been built into tuition. So, I mean, those classes would have been really helpful and anything you can take that's about negotiation or, um, even listening skills, the like human dynamics, culture differences, all of those help because you don't know by looking at somebody what life experience they're taking with you. 
And you might say something that they hear completely differently. So learning how to say the same thing in a mediation four times differently is really valuable. I agree with everything that Mary said, especially the expense part. <laughs> uh, in New York and New Jersey, the requirement is very similar. You have to take a minimum of a 40 hour class uh, for the basics. And then you have to every year or two years after that, you have to take a certain number of continuing credits. Uh, as for the certification aspect of it, uh, both New York and New Jersey, the certification is basically part of the court rules, meaning that if you wanna be a court appointed mediator, then you have to meet the qualifications. The reality is anybody can mediate at any time for any reason because it's outside the court system. Uh, but once you bring it into the court system, there's very stringent qualifications for the mediators, very stringent rules as to what we can and cannot do in mediation. Uh, there are confidentiality rules. There are rules that nobody's gonna call you to testify as to what was going on in the mediation. Uh, generally speaking, the matrimonial mediators are limited to just the financial aspect. The matrimonial mediators that are certified cannot handle a domestic violence uh, if there's a history of domestic violence in an action, uh, unless they have taken certain courses to be able to do that. And those mediations are under judicial supervision in the courthouse. So of course, during the pandemic, that pretty much put a hold on everything, even though you might still be able to do a Zoom type mediation. Uh, the court rules for New Jersey is NJ rule one colon 40. And for New York state, it's part 146 of the court rules uh, in order to become a rostered mediator. I think Mary may have already answered this, but, um, and Glenn, you, I think you did a little bit too, but what are some of the, uh, what, how did you integrate mediation into your law practice? Uh, you know, if you, if you don't do mediation completely, what, what, how did you, how were you able to integrate it into what your standard law practice? Well, integration, it, it gets a little complicated and in a little bit, I'll post some of the articles I wrote. The last article I wrote was the con complexity of intake when first contact is made with a matrimonial client. You know, you get a phone call, you don't know whether you're being retained as a mediator or whether you're gonna be retained as a litigation attorney on their behalf. So there's very limited information you wanna get from them uh, on that first phone call before you're conflicted out. And so first thing you have to do is decide what role you're gonna play and sometimes that takes the caller by surprise because they didn't even know the concept of mediation existed. Mm -hmm. uh, so the goal is, as far as I'm concerned, is to try to save the clients as much money as possible, try to make it as amicable as possible so that they can live into the future uh, with their decisions that they make instead of some stranger in the black robes making the decisions for them. So mediation is a little uh, tough to say because we're not arbitrators and there are different types of mediation that you could be involved with. Uh, New Jersey insists that all mediators be what we call facilitators or facilitative mediation as opposed to evaluative mediation. But the reality is most of the retired judges that become mediators all do evaluative mediation and basically wind up telling you, this is what it's going to be, you know, that we should settle now and that type of thing. Whereas facilitative mediation is more, what do you want? What can we work out? What does your budget allow for? Is what you're looking for realistic? And is it fair to the other side uh, to help them move forward in life? So it's a different mindset. So as you go along, there are different issues that come up. How about you, Mary? I know you said you do family law. Do you, or, you know, have you integrate? Have you been able to integrate both court practice and 
mediation into into your practice? I really haven't. The approach I took when I first got um, into mediation as the mediator was that I volunteered through legal aid. So I was already part of their system as a volunteer attorney. Um, and I take some cases pro bono and I take some cases on, on a, like a low scale contract basis. And so when I got the mediation, um, they asked if I would consider mediating cases for them. So sometimes I get paid half of my fee um, because one party pays, but the other party came from legal aid. And a few times I have gotten paid none of my fee and I, you know, spend the four to eight hours mediating and, um, but I really love it. I've wanted to do this job as a, as a family law attorney since I was really young. I thought it would look a little different. I thought some more adoptions and a little less divorce, but that's not the way this works. So I do a lot more divorce and a little bit of adoption. Um, but that, that really helped, you know, that got my name to a bunch of different attorneys, because if you have half of the attorneys using you are in private practice, you know, it, it's like anything else you get talked about, you get referrals. Somebody says, oh yeah, I used her. She, she settled a really difficult case. Why don't we go try to use her again? Um, so just that word of mouth really helped. And then as I added more of the ADR practice to my own practice, we put out releases. So we just put out, um, you know, my hourly rate for whatever it is. I, I also do full custody evaluations now where I go in and spend four to eight months with the families. A little bit harder on Zoom, right? You kind of zoom into parents' lives now instead of being able to go to ball games and, and schools and things like that. But we just started putting out, you know, announcements to, to our co fellow colleagues and said, this is what I'm going to be doing. Here's my hourly rate. Here's the information. Um, and that, that has worked well. You know, my hope is to get more on the mediation side, the closer I get to retirement, because that's, that's a nicer practice. Um, but we'll see. It was so far, it's been working well. I must say that a lot of the stuff that Mary's mentioning in New York and New Jersey, they require you to have some sort of psychological or social work background. And if you don't have that type of background, you can't mediate those type of cases or those aspects of the cases. So we are limited in New York and New Jersey regarding that. Interesting. That kind of leads us into the next question, which is, um, you know, one, how did, what are some ways that people can get into doing mediation and ADR? And then also, how did you get into that, uh, into that field? I think Mary kind of, Mary just touched on that in her answer. What about you, Glenn? Um, how did you get into the mediation and alternative dispute resolution? And what are some suggestions you would have for someone who's looking into, to get into that or add it to their practice? Okay. First thing I would say is I got started basically volunteering for the small claims court as an arbitrator. Uh, I did that for several years. Uh, kind of liked it, kind of didn't like it. It was a lot of volunteer work, which was fine. Uh, you know, you have six minutes or eight minutes to make a decision about a case and whatever you decide pretty much goes and that's the way that worked. When it came to doing mediation, I decided to do it after I had uh, an issue with my health. And I said, you know what? I got to ease off the stress of doing matrimonial law and the litigation involved in it. So I decided to take the uh, mediation courses. Uh, and then I got involved with that. And because of my litigation experience, it was a lot easier for me to transition into that role because I knew the role that each party had to play, how to handle it, how not to handle it. Uh, and because of that, I've gained a lot of experience and was able to do it. Uh, the court rosters in both New York and New Jersey require you to have basically five years of experience, equivalent experience, in order to become a rostered attorney, uh, mediator, or they expect you to be mentored and participate in mediations, a certain number of mediations in order to qualify. What about you, and I think I saw Mark on Annette on the line before. I believe he already took the course in New Jersey or is in the process of doing so. 
So maybe he could answer that question for everybody. I actually haven't started the, the course. Like oh, you haven't? Okay. Thank you, though. Thank you, Mark. Um, Mary, do you have any else, anything else to add for how would someone break into the into the field or add mediation and, and some of the other alternative dispute resolution into their practice? I really think it is just, you know, getting your name out there, letting people know that you do this um, and volunteering really is a great way to get that done. Um, you know, whether you're paid a small portion or, or not, it is worth it to build up that, that reputation and, and your practice. And then, um, so our, our last prepared question is, um, what are some of the main benefits of mediation and, and alternative dispute resolutions for your clients and your practice? My favorite thing to tell them is this is the one guaranteed place you keep all of the decisions. So I tell my clients, depending on the age of their kids, right? So if you have kids that are like under 12, I tell my clients, you know, 95% of what goes on at your house. And then if you have children that are 13 and above, that percentage just keeps going down, right? But you still know the most. So I say like, you know, you take, you take, you know, this much, you and your, your and spouse. If you are working with me as an attorney, I know this much, right? Like you've done your best. I've read hours of things. We've talked about things. I have watched all the videos. I have listened to all the recording, but now we're going to go to mediation and it's your job to tell your story, but you keep all the control. If we go to court, the judge knows this much. You know, we started way out here and now the judge gets this much because no matter how much I write, it's still black and white. It's on a page. The judge isn't going to listen to hours and hours of testimony. You know, that's, that's giving up a lot of control over what are the most important things in your life, right? Your kids, your money, your, your possessions, hopefully in that order for parents. Um, it's not always the case. Sometimes we fight more about the money than the kids. Um, but I tell them that that's, that's the success, right? If you can make the decisions yourself, keep control of that situation, and you might not like it, but I can never make three kids into six. So you're not ever going to like the decision, but you're sure as heck going to like it more than a, a stranger in a black robe telling you, well, this is what you're going to do. Because judges, just by the way that this works, they, they have a default that they have to follow. And they have things like, okay, if you get Thanksgiving, she gets Christmas. And if you get Halloween, well, you're going to get Easter. And they try to make it fair. But in mediation, I always tell my clients, and even when I'm the mediator, this is your last chance. This is your first and your last chance to be completely in control of the best decision that you can live with. You don't have to love all of it, but you just have to be willing to live with it and know that your kids were put in the best place and that this is what's going to be best for your family. And I also tell them that they're more successful, right? Court orders are followed better if they are mediated and not litigated. Um, and then honestly, I, I have the checkbook conversation, right? So I have an hourly rate. The mediator has an hourly rate. Your custody evaluator has an hourly rate. And if we can stop all of that right now at mediation, you walked out a lot better because trial starts at $10,000. And that's a short half day trial. I mean, that's really limited issues. Um, I used to clerk for a judge in law school who at the initial case management conference, which in Minnesota, you're supposed to have one when you file a divorce within two weeks of filing. You meet your judge, you talk about the ADR process you're gonna choose. And he would come down in khakis and a button down shirt. He would sit in front of counsel table and he would say, this is my name. The next time you see me, I'm gonna be up there in the black robe. The court reporter is gonna be typing away but we're going to have a conversation. And he always asks, have you ever gone to Paris? 
Because most people, their answer to that is no. You know, we, we've never been to Paris. And he'd say, great. Do you want to send those two to Paris? Because the parties were always in the middle. The attorneys were always on the outside. Or do you want to go to Paris or send your kids to college? This is your choice. You either make them really rich or you make the two of you really happy. And that really stuck with people watching him say that. Um, so I tend to give my clients a very similar speech about this is your chance. This is your first and your last chance that you're going to make the decisions that you're going to keep the money um, and you're going to keep the control. And that, that really works because nobody wants to give the intimate details of their lives on public record. And nobody wants people deciding, um, you know, a stranger deciding like, where's your kid going to sleep every night? And where's your kid going to go to school? What about you, Glenn? I agree with everything uh, that was just said. Uh, the money issue is very important for the clients. Uh, if they're paying one mediator an hourly rate, it's better than paying two attorneys. Uh, so you got savings right there. Uh, you want to make sure that they understand that they are making the decision, not somebody else. They're not fighting. Uh, it's a different attitude. It could take as long as we need to have it take. There is no rush to complete the process when doing mediation, whereas in court, you have to follow a certain time schedule. Uh, the biggest problem that I've come across is that matrimonial attorneys don't know how to get out of the way of their clients in order to allow the mediation to go through comfortably and to be completed. Uh, matrimonial attorneys, when I am mediating and people feel they have to have their attorneys with them, which is absolutely not a requirement, but they still feel more comfortable having the attorney with them. I find the attorneys start arguing the case. They treat me as if I'm the judge. And I try to tell them, I'm not the judge. I'm not making a decision based on the law or as the law as you presented to me. It's not my role. My role is to get the parties to understand what it is they want, what they're capable of doing, and most of all, what's in the best interest of the children. And once the clients understand that concept, things tend to go a lot smoother. I also explained to them that if there is any questions regarding their financials, you know, this one's working off the books or there's some other type of issue like that. If you go to court and you start to testify about that, the judge is gonna have to report you to the IRS. There are certain rules that judges have to follow that I as a mediator are not going to follow because we have a confidential relationship that has been set up by statute. So what's said here stays here. And then the methodology that's used between the mediators, everybody uses a different style. We have something called a caucus. Caucus is when you take one of the parties into a different room and you start talking to them and you find out more information and you find out what it is that they're telling you that you could disclose to the other side. What is it they don't want you to disclose to the other side? Then you go into the other room and do the same thing and you go back and forth. That's what we call shuttle diplomacy. That occurs probably more often in a civil action than in matrimonials. Matrimonials, we tend to keep them in the same room at the same time because we're discussing their budgets, what they could afford, what they can't afford, what's in the best interest of the children, what is realistic. Uh, with regards to whether or not the children could do their after-school activities, uh, whether or not they're actually going to be able to go to college or capable of going to college, and if so, what type of college. Uh, a lot of financial planning and other things. And in mediation, we tend to refer to experts. There's no problem with us saying, you know what, this aspect you better go speak to an accountant about or if we have to do a business evaluation, a forensic evaluation, are we gonna do it jointly? Or are you each gonna hire your own, your own experts in order to determine certain things? And of course, now with uh, COVID and everything else, real estate has become a hot topic because mm -hmm. houses are a lot more valuable. People wanna force the other side to sell the house instead of staying, staying in the house. So a lot of that uh, has become uh, 
a major issue that we have to deal with on a relatively quick basis. Great, thank you. So we're gonna open up the, uh, I'm sorry, Mary, were you gonna say something? I was just gonna say, I think there's also the, the opportunity to watch the, especially in family law mediation, these two people that never thought that they would be at your table, right? So usually you don't get married thinking, this is a great first wife. And in two years, we're gonna we're we're gonna trade, right? Like that's just not the normal approach. So, it, a lot of the times, that mediation session is really helpful for the. I'm sorry, this is the way our our marriage went. You know, I've seen that more often than not. And then once that apology is given, and it's not even the big apologies like, "Yep, I had the affair. It was my fault." Sometimes it's just the like, "I'm sorry, this didn't work." And once either side or both sides get that recognition, all of a sudden that creativity that Glenn and I have been talking about comes out, right? Like, well, you really want to keep the kids in one of my cases, drag racing. So like, how do we get you to drag racing and who's going to pay for that? And what does that look like? And what do my weekends look like? You know, that's something I don't know that you can always have time in a court process to really to really get to, right? It's it's a lot easier to say, yep, every other weekend, two nights a week, switching holidays, instead of me sitting there or the other attorney sitting there going, so drag racing, your honor, occurs from August 15th until November 15th. And during that time, we really need the weekends to look like this. I mean, it's so minute that it's really difficult for the court to handle. I mean, I'm, I'm lucky I'm in a county where I have brought some really minute issues and the judges do, they take the time to sit and listen. Um, but mediation is the place where you tell your client, like you're absolutely gonna get the chance to talk through this, to, to talk about what solution is best for your family. And I think when they, when they hear that and they can just be validated of like, yep, my life situation sucks right now and we're gonna be in this together for a really long time with our kids that really helps the process and it, it helps them co-parent afterwards successfully. Awesome. So um, if you have any questions, we're gonna open it up to questions. If you have any questions, just put it in the chat um, and I'll, I'll pose them to Mary and Glenn and uh, we can open it up. So um, I think Mark had said, very interesting, Mary, this concept is new to me. Would it be reasonable to call your decision single issue arbitration? And I, I think if I'm right, Mark, you were talking about the parenting um, at the coach. That's, that, that's, that's correct. Um, and uh, let me preface it by saying that I've been representing clients in many, uh, in, in many mediations, but they've all been uh, regular civil. Um, you know, my partner handles all the, uh, uh, we call it in Virginia or the Washington DC area, we call it, uh, uh, you know, divorce law, but, uh, you know, matrimonial law. Um, so it's kind of a new world, you know, for me to begin with. But I, I found that kind of, you know, kind of interesting that it sounds like it works as a regular mediation until it reaches a certain point. And um, there are particular issues, uh, not the whole kit and caboodle that uh, you, you, you're in effect arbitrating. Or... Yeah, so a, a lot of the times, um as a parenting consultant, I'm getting hired after they already have that initial order. So sometimes we're hired before to help the, you know, if we know the divorce is going to go on for a long time, sometimes we get hired beforehand to kind of deal with these issues as they're, as they're working through the divorce. But most of the cases are afterwards and I can't deal with custody. So I can't change legal or physical custody. I can only deal with issues that come up with the kids. Um, a great example is like when they want to change schools. So I, you know, I sit there and I hear them out like, okay, your Catholic school education is ending. There's not another Catholic school in the area that offers high school. So now we have to choose a high school. So what are we going to do? And it really is a, a kind of that arbitration process, right? Where you talk and you reach a point and you say, okay, if you're really done and you want this to be my choice, then, then here's the process that I'm gonna take for that. Um, my favorite thing is putting on jeans and a t-shirt and a baseball cap and going into the schools, 
you know, cause I sit and talk to the kids where they're at. I don't, we don't often have them come into my office, right? I don't want to look scary. Um, so I, I do that. I investigate as much as I need to, to make a good, hopefully good decision. Um, so sometimes it's single issue, but sometimes it's rolled up like uh, school issues tend to deal a lot with sports, you know, so I, they want to play hockey. Well, what's the better hockey team on top of where's a good education? And if that's the case, who's then going to drive? And can we get the child a car? So I'd like to say it's single issue, but in, in family law, it just sort of spirals into all these like tertiary issues that come through. Yeah. So it's everything but custody and uh, would, would then uh, d uh, divvying up the major holidays that would, that would uh, be in the realm of custody and it would be something you would decide, but really anything else might be fair, might be something that you would. Right. So I just can't change legal custody. Um, physical custody isn't as relevant in Minnesota anymore because we really deal with it through your parenting time schedule and through some other designations. Um, but if they're saying, you know, I don't think he should have legal custody anymore. He's wrecked all the decisions we've tried to make. Then I have to say, okay, I mean, I, I can't help you with that. You have to go to the judge for that. But if it's a, should my kid get the COVID or HPV vaccine? We can decide that as parenting consultants, um, braces, school choice. I've, I even wrote a cell phone decision. So could the kid get a cell phone? And very, very specifically, what apps, what parent controls, where the cell phone is at all at every night, and what time the cell phone can be turned on and off every day. So I and mean, when you talk about minutia, we can get we can get pretty, pretty minute as parenting consultants, but we also spend a ton of time with the family. So it really gives us a, a, a different aspect um, into their lives than just, you know, your attorney gets or, or certainly a, a, a judge. Mark, I might add to that, especially with civil cases in New York and New Jersey. We are not allowed to be mediators and then arbitrators in the same matter. Oh, okay. That's forbidden. And once you're a mediator, you cannot be the arbitrator. If you do that transfer over, you're in violation and in conflict. Thank you. So, and I believe the carve out a parenting consultant is the only way it happens in Minnesota too. Yeah, I think there might be a carve out at least yep. in New Jersey with regards to the parenting coordinator. Thank you. So I have a question from Kelsey. It says she's really interested, really interested in real estate law. How do you go about resolving the real estate disputes when one party wants to sell and the other party does not? Well, real estate disputes uh, are case specific, obviously. Uh, most of the disputes with regards to whether or not somebody should sell when dealing with family law is based upon the finances. And again, as mediators, we're not the decision makers. We can only help the parties reach their own conclusions. If not, they're going to go before a judge. Uh, mediated real estate disputes are sometimes between neighbors, noise complaints, easements, whether or not a tree branch should be cut down, whether or not a dog should be kept outside at night. You know, a lot of different issues that come up with real estate. But as mediators, we can only have the parties reach a conclusion on their own. We're not making a decision for them. So whether they should sell or not sell, it's a matter of taking the finances, breaking it down, seeing the reality of the situation, who could afford living without it? Can one parent afford to buy out the other? What's their credit like? How long is it gonna take? Uh, are there tax consequences involved if they hang on to the house for several number of years? Is the kid going to be disrupted so they're not going to school? There's a lot of issues that we kind of focus the parties on in order to reach a conclusion, but we can't make that decision for them. And then uh, Mark's, Mark's question was, how important is it to have a mentor as a mediator for yourself as a new mediator? Mary, you want to try that one first? Yeah, I, so my training was fantastic because after some 
amount of like classroom time, we mediated cases in front of other mediators. And, you know, they, they gave us tips and nicely heckled us when we didn't do such a great job, right? Like, you know, you hopefully you don't you get the red card of like, ah, stop, wait a second. You, you, you crossed over to therapist or you crossed over to attorney. You need to come back to mediator. Um, so that was really helpful. And I have a group of um, mediators, lawyers, parenting consultants, and mental health professionals that pre-COVID, we were, you know, meeting for lunch regularly and talking through cases and talking through how would you approach this and what would you do? Or I was at mediation and this happened. So um, maybe not even looking for like that one mentor, but a group of people that's mixed between backgrounds and mixed also between experience, you know, have a couple new people, have a couple of people who have done this for a really long time. Um, and that helps just to kind of bounce ideas off and, and generate new ideas of how do you approach the mediation? You know, what do you say? How do you, how do you help that, that the parties through this? I believe mentor mediations, uh, mentors for mediators is very important. You're never experienced enough to handle everything that comes your way. Uh, I'm a member of New Jersey Association of Professional Mediators known as NJAPM. And we have what's known as peer groups. And the peer groups meet for lunch uh, usually once a month. Different parts of the state meet at different times. So of course with COVID, it was a lot easier to visit uh, different groups in order to see what's going on in their particular groups. But the experience ranges anywhere from people who have been doing it for 45 years to people who have been doing it for 45 minutes. Uh, and we get to bounce questions off. We get to review uh, interesting decisions that take place having to do with uh, mediation, uh, having to do with changes in the tax law having to do with different focuses that people might need, whether it be uh, hiring a forensic accountant and how they might make their decisions, uh, knowing how to handle certain aspects such as vaccinations. Uh, and everybody takes different approaches. You'll find most mediators tend to be either having a background of legal, financial, social or psychological. Occasionally you'll have the expert who might be a chemistry or some other patent and trademark expert who will handle those type of cases. Uh, you'll find people who are more comfortable handling stuff they're familiar with. Employment lawyers like to handle employment cases. Landlord-tenant lawyers like to handle landlord-tenant cases. Matrimonial lawyers do matrimonial. Uh, so, you got to find people that you can work with. And after a while, you know who the experts are in the field. You know who everybody turns to answer the questions. If you go on Facebook, there's Facebook pages all over the place for mediators, especially mediators in your state. And so I would suggest, yes, join the local organization and see what's going on. Uh, there are a couple of good websites for mediators. I think the most prevalent one is probably mediate.com. That's where a lot of mediators advertise their services and what's available. I just wanted to, to jump in because I, I am getting into mediation and joining the New Jersey Association of Professional Mediators is phenomenal. I actually go to the groups at all the counties that I hang out and just learn from people like Glenn. It, it's probably one of the most powerful things that you can do if you want to, to learn about mediation. I think you said it best when you said it's empowering because you don't feel like you're working in a vacuum. You feel like what you're doing is correct. Uh, and again, it's, it's tough. It really is. Am I doing it right? Should I be doing shuttle diplomacy or should I be keeping them in the room? And at what point should I break? Should I do mediations for two hours a day or should we set it for an eight hour day? and just keep them there until they finally reach a decision. 
different place, different people do it differently. There's one judge in New Jersey, a retired judge. The first thing you do when you show up to his mediation is he hands you the menu for lunch and he has you order lunch. So you pretty much of the mindset, once you're there, you're stuck there all day. He's not going to let you out in an hour. That's the way he handles it. Personally, I don't like that. I don't think it works well, but uh, it seems to work for him because he's been, he was on the bench for so long. I mean, I will say food works well though. So maybe not <laughs> lunch, right? But food right. works really well. There's, there's a mediator I use whenever the other side will agree. Um, she's fantastic, really well known in our area. And they have this amazing drink bar where you can get like any flavored bubbly water you could ask for, any soda. She's got tons of coffee, tea, cocoa, mix-ins. And our clients love it because when you're nervous, you eat, right? And so, and in the middle of the table, pre-COVID, she had chocolates and like nut mixes, granola bars. I mean, she had this huge variety of food and I would watch clients fidget and then grab like a hard candy and unwrap it and eat that. And they, you know, they kind of calm down and because nobody makes a good decision on an empty stomach. So, I mean, that is a big tip. If you're going to go into mediation and if you're doing them in person, a bowl of snacks is a really good idea. I think Mary Kathleen said something and I don't want people to miss it. She said, so long as the parties agree, that's the important part in the selection of a mediator. It's not a one-sided decision. It's the parties agreeing. Occasionally you'll have the court assign a mediator and then the parties have a certain number of days in which to opt out. But other than that, if both parties don't agree, you're not gonna be the mediator. Mm -hmm. And that's the important part. And that's where you have to really sell yourself and your qualifications and what you might be able to do for them without showing bias. Uh, and that's where the hard part comes in, not showing bias. Great. Um, so I'm just, I'm, we're, we're getting, we're kind of getting towards the end of our time and I wanted to um, thank both Glenn and Mary for their time and sharing their expertise. Um, do you have any final words of wisdom you would give to someone who, who wants to break into the field or wants to build more, build more of their skill set to, to do mediation and um, alternative dispute resolution? I would say do it now. Don't wait. The longer you wait to do it, the more you're going to regret it later on because you're going to kick yourself for not doing it sooner. Uh, if you're a litigator and you wind up participating in mediation, it's a lot different when you're at the head of the table uh, and you're trying to figure things out. Uh, understand that mediation ends usually in what we call a memorandum of understanding, which is just an agreement between the parties that this is what they thinking they're gonna to agree to, and then they're directed to take it to a review attorney to review what was done before they actually sign the agreement. Uh, a lot of times they wanna skip that part and depending on the state you're in, uh, whether or not that should be done is a different story. So I would look into it, investigate, gain the experience as soon as possible. What about you, Mary? Yeah, I agree with Glenn. Like, if you want to do this, just jump in because it, it can't end badly, right? Even if you're mediating and they don't reach an agreement, that was still their choice. And, and you're not responsible for that. And so much as lawyers, we feel that we're responsible for so much of it. But for mediation, I mean, it's, it's fantastic. And you get to watch people who are at odds for whatever reason. And most of the time, they leave your office with an agreement, whether it's a full agreement or a partial agreement. I mean, you, you got them on their way and you got them heard, which overall is really, really what want, people want to be is heard. Um, and quickly, I did drop my email in the chat because Stephanie Brown, I saw you have a very specific question and I just read a fantastic article about parenting and breastfeeding 
and should we be counting it as best interest? So shoot me an email and I'll try to scan it in and send it to you. Because it I was actually did send you that in an email with Stephanie's email address. Oh, perfect. Okay, because I'm gonna say it's it's a great article and it's a it's a really big question right now. So somebody very talented tackled it and I enjoyed their article. So I'll share it with you. And then there's one last question and, and I really like this one. Do you have, are there any books or other resources on mediation that you would recommend? Um, honestly, anything that you can get your hands on that talks about people that do not look like you, live the way you live, um, act like you. I mean, anything. I, and I, I, I can't stress that enough. Like I didn't grow up in Minnesota. And so I start mediations and I, I, I start client interviews with, by the way, I didn't grow up here. I'm really blunt. And if you don't like that, you should tell me, right? So I tell people like, I know that this is an issue. I know that I'm blunt. I know I'm really blunt for Minnesota. Um, so just tell me. And so, t you know, if you can read books that are like that, and if you can read books um, or take we, we took some assessments during mediation training um, and, and PC training about where do your own biases lie? You know, things that you don't even realize, you know, that you think of like, oh, well, these people are, are fighting about the cat. Well, maybe you don't like animals. And so you're sitting through this mediation going like, oh, help me, help me now. Why are you fighting about a cat? My mediation this afternoon is about three kids. But just those things. So if you can read assessments um, about yourself, if you can read books about, you know, people that are different than you, how to approach conversations um, with different genders, with different cultures, all of that is really helpful as a mediator. I would say the most popular book is Getting to Yes. Yeah. Uh, not a big fan of the book, but that seems to be the most popular one. Sure. especially for people starting out. Great, thank you both very much. Um, Glenn and Mary's book in information is in the chat. And also Glenn had posted some links to articles that he's he's written, so. Um, I'll do it again, just in case there was some late arri arrivals. That would be great. Um, it looks like Joanne posted some in, or, uh, some links as well. So. Um, thank you all for coming. Stay tuned for our next set of PED speaker series uh, topics. Uh, next, next month, we're going to look at family law and custody. Um, the following July, July, I think we're going to do cryptocurrencies and NFTs. So um, there's lots of topics coming up. But thank you all. Thank you, Glenn and Mary, for participating and sharing your expertise. We really appreciate it. Um, I hope you all have a good evening. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you everybody.